Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar on what your practices need to know about privacy and my health record assessments. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we're meeting on and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and elders from other communities who may be joining us today. So some housekeeping before we start. We are recording the session and you will receive a copy of the recording um, at the conclusion of today. Uh, you can ask a question at any time by typing into the chat and if you should need to collapse to go to your interface, just click on that little orange arrow at the top of the screen that you can see here. If your screen and your sound don't match, you just may have some lag in your internet. All right, so I'll just introduce you now to our wonderful pan panel members. Um, so firstly, Andre is the Director of the Assessment Section in the Regulation and Strategy Bench of the Australian Information Commission. Andre leads the development and delivery of OAC assessment program to successfully identify privacy risks across the public and private sectors. Now, prior to this role, Andre worked as an assistant director in OAC's health and technology section. He has completed a Bachelor of Arts with first class honours and a Juris Doctor, doctor and admitted to the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Now, before working at OAC, Andre had an extensive career as a media producer before retraining as a lawyer and advising clients in the media and entertainment and technology sectors in the matters of privacy law. Diana is the Assistant Director of the Health and Technology Section in the Regulation and Strategy Branch of the Office of the Australian Information Commission. Diana is a subject matter expert on, on digital health in the policy area at OAC and has been involved in this work for over 10 years. Now, before joining OAC in 2011, Diana worked as an Associate at the Administrative Appeals Tribunal as a government lawyer. She holds a Bachelor of Laws and a Bachelor of Business Administration from Macquarie University, Sydney, and a Graduate Certificate in Legal Practice. And she was admitted as a legal practitioner to the Supreme Court in New South Wales in 2010. Thanks, Diana. Next from the um, Australian Digital Health Agency, we have Kim Richter. Kim is a senior policy advisor with the agency and has been working in the health and policy and legislation for well over 30, 23 years. And the last 12 years have been spent with the My Health Record program. Now before joining Digital Health, Kim managed the Department of Health legislative program. And Delaney Smith, who is also a Senior Privacy Policy Advisor in the Strate Strategy, Policy and Privacy Branch here at the agency. Now Delaney is a subject matter expert on privacy and has been involved with this work for over 10 years. Now before joining the agency in 2021, Delaney worked as an investigative officer for 10 years at the Office of the Australian Information Commission. She holds an Associate Degree in Law, Paralegal Studies, a Bachelor of Laws both from Southern Cross University and a graduate certificate in legal practice. She was admitted as a legal practitioner to the Supreme Court of New South Wales in February 2020. Welcome um, to everyone. Now, the Privacy Act of 1988 and the associated 13 Australian privacy principles govern the way in which organisations must manage personal information, and that includes sensitive health information. So now I'll hand over to Delaney to talk to you all more about privacy. Thanks, Delaney. Everyone, and um, thank you for joining us. My role here in the agency as a senior privacy advisor is to advise projects and teams on all things privacy. As mentioned in my profile earlier by Nikki, I did work at the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner for 10 years, which gave me a very good grounding on what is privacy by design. So we, my colleagues and I, we're responsible for answering any questions that come to us from different teams and ensuring that privacy and personal information handling is at the forefront of what is done in the office. We are here to assist and if you need any questions answered, just reach out and we are more than happy to help. We also manage the agency's relationship with the OAIC and we work closely with them to ensure that the agency is following best privacy practice in all that we do and the OAIC pr provides us with valuable feedback and guidance on what is best privacy practice. So 
we look forward to and welcome our engagement with the OAIC. Uh, that's about it from me. Shall I hand over to Ben or Nikki? Uh, no, that's great. Thanks so much, Delaney. Sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble um, here. I <laughs> <Let's> apologise. <take> <laughs> <it. laughs> so, look, along with privacy, organisations also must comply with certain requirements in order to participate in My Health Record. So, let's now hear from Kim, um, who can talk to us more about these requirements. Thanks, Kim. All right, so for those of you who have had any involvement so far in the My Health Record system, you know that there is rather an extensive uh, policy framework for the system. And while I could probably speak about that in the legislation all day, I don't know that that would please anyone. So I will keep this as brief as I possibly can. So any entity that wants to participate in the My Health Record system, no matter what they're doing, they all need to meet a set of requirements. And those requirements are about ensuring that they all meet certain standards to protect the security of the information in the My Health Record system, to ensure the security of the system, and to make sure we can actually deliver a system that meets its objectives and is of value to people. We didn't just create these requirements arbitrarily, and we know that meeting the requirements can be another step in what might be a rather lengthy process for some organisations. But each of the requirements is in place for a very specific reason. Any healthcare organisation that wants to participate in the My Health Record system is going to need to meet all of these requirements. Some of the requirements reflect things that the organisation is probably already doing just by virtue of providing healthcare. Things like reporting data breaches and ensuring currency and accuracy of information. Some of the requirements are about achieving the objectives of the system, that is, making sure we can deliver a system that is a valuable tool for reducing the fragmentation of health information that helps inform healthcare decisions, and that gives more control to consumers in terms of managing their health information and being a part of their own healthcare. Some of the requirements are about protecting the rights of consumers and healthcare providers. So in terms of consumers, there are requirements about making sure that you don't load certain health information into the My Health Records system, and that reflects consumer control of what is and isn't in their My Health Record system, in the My Health Record, excuse me. Other rights are about healthcare providers. We know that healthcare providers have intellectual property rights and the My Health Record cannot infringe on those rights. And finally, we've got the requirements that are about accountability. The My Health Record system is after all a government system as well as a health information system. So we need to make sure that we and anyone contributing information to the system is accountable. This comes down to authentication and identification, knowing who we're dealing with, knowing who's created information. Next slide, please. All of these requirements that apply to healthcare provider organisations are laid out in the My Health Records Act and in the My Health Records Rule. They're reflected in the guidance material that we produce and in all of the education pieces that we provide out to the audience. Now, the requirement that's particularly relevant to today's discussion is the requirement for a healthcare organisation to have a written policy in place which addresses a number of matters. This policy is about the organisation, about how the organisation is going to use the My Health Record system, how it will interact with the system, who in the organisation can access the system, how they're going to be trained, what security mechanisms the organisation has, and how the organisation will deal with potential breaches. Now, this policy is intended to lay out these things not just for the visibility of the My Health Record system operator, if we ask to see it but more importantly for your own organisation so that your staff have visibility and understand how you intend and expect the My Health Record system to be used and for all matters to be handled. This policy isn't meant to be something that you just produce as a compliance activity. You don't just prepare it and file away. It's actually meant to be an evolving document that continues to be of practical use to the organisation. It needs to be reviewed regularly to reflect changing circumstances for example, over time, an organisation changes the way it uses the system and the security mechanisms will probably evolve. So these things all need to be reflected in the policy. The policy needs to be accessible to staff so they can access it when they need it. And if for some reason the system operator needs to see your policy, whether it's the current policy or an older version of the policy, it needs to be made available. Now, the need for this policy is a requirement of your participation in the My Health Record system. So an organisation needs to have one in place, at the, they, in place at the time they apply to register 
and they need to have one in place while ever they are registered. And a failure to comply with this requirement may incur penalties. Uh, it there may be sanctions just to remedy the situation. They may be more serious. It will depend on the circumstances. So that's enough from me and I will now hand back to Nicola. Thank you so much, Kim. That was great. Um, so let's now hear from Andre to talk to you all now about what you need to know and expect from an assessment. Thanks, Andre. Thanks for that introduction, Nikki, and thanks to Delaney and Kim for their presentations. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm the um, Director of the Assessment Section in Regulation and Strategy at the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, and then I oversee the development and delivery of our assessments program. So I'd like to thank the Australian Digital Health Agency for organising this session today. I'd also like to thank uh, the attendees for dedicating time to attend and listen. So the topic of my presentation today is my health record assessments. Uh, but as part of that, I'm going to provide you with an overview of the privacy assessment process as it's conducted by, the, by our office. I should mention that I'm joined on the call today by my colleague Diana Weston, who's the Assistant Director in the Health and Technology team, um, and she's a subject matter expert in digital health, and Diana and I will be happy to take questions through, during the Q&A part of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So firstly, I'll quickly touch on the role of our office. Uh, so the OAIC is an independent statutory body established under the Australian Information Commissioner Act and our purpose is to promote and uphold privacy and information access rights. Many of you will be familiar with our work but perhaps not the breadth of what we do. So our, our functions include handling complaints about possible interferences with privacy, conducting investigations and if warranted taking regulatory action either into complaints or on the Commissioner's initiative. We also provide advice and guidance to our stakeholders who, are, who include individuals, government and businesses. We also undertake proactive regulatory activities in the form of assessments. So when, when we say we provide advice, we provide advice and assistance to individuals to help them to understand and apply their privacy rights. And we also provide advice to government agencies and private sector organisations to help them understand their obligations under the Privacy Act. The IIC has three branches, dispute resolution, regulation and strategy and corporate. And as Nikki mentioned, I lead the privacy assessments team in regulation and strategy. Next slide, please. So what is a privacy assessment? So we really approach privacy assessments uh, as an educative exercise. Uh, it's a, it's a intended to provide a professional, independent and systematic appraisal of how well an agency or an organisation or a discrete part of an agency or organisation complies with all or part of its privacy obligations. Historically, assessments were, were called audits um, and in some ways they are very much like an audit. An assessment is really a snapshot of personal information handling practices at a certain time and in a particular location. And we use assessments to facilitate compliance by identifying privacy risks and making recommendations to entities to address those privacy risks. Some assessments may focus on uh, really examining an entity's compliance with particular uh, legislative obligations. And an example uh, in this case is uh, the Rule 42 obligations under the My Health Records Rule. Next slide, please. So this is a bit of an overview of the whole privacy assessment process at a higher level. So we identify four key main stages that are commonly involved in the conduct of a privacy assessment. And they are targeting, planning and notification, fieldwork and reporting. And depending on the nature and the, or complexity of an assessment, this process can take anywhere from say 12 to you know, up to 24 weeks to complete. Though some of our assessments can take significantly longer, particularly when we're um, dealing with more complex areas and also where we're perhaps doing um, you know, in-depth site visits. So now I'll just provide you with an overview on each of these stages. Next slide, please. 
So starting with targeting, each year we undergo a planning and targeting exercise where we consider a range of information and we use that to identify a forward program of assessments. So this exercise also identifies strategic assessments for the coming year and sets the priorities for our work program. The OAIC is funded to undertake assessments under both memoranda, memoranda, memoranda of Understanding or MOUs and also by direct appropriation. And historically, we've been funded uh, under MOU to undertake um, assessments in the digital health space uh, with, the, with the agency. Uh, however, going forward, we're now doing that via direct appropriation. And we also provide policy advice and we have other functions um, that we undertake under that funding as well. So we also may identify what we call strategic assessments. Um, so those assessments are really trying to target in on an area where we may see there being potential privacy risk. And when planning these assessments, we, we consider a range of information, for, which may include things like complaint, inquiry, and other data that we receive as an office. We might look at media reports and matters of public interest. And we also undertake our own, own risk-based analysis. So for each individual assessment, uh, we set out and identify the scope and the objective of that assessment. So the scope is really what will and will not be considered in the course of the assessment. And there are usually a couple of elements to the scope. So we have the factual scope being um, matters like the entity's functions, programs that might be undertaking, particular activities or processes or systems that will be considered by the assessment. And then we have the legal scope. So this would be looking at the particular uh, legal obligations that an entity may have and that will be considered or examined through the course of the assessment. For example, obligations under a particular Australian privacy principle. In terms of the object objective of the assessment, this is really the purpose of the assessment. And it's usually phrased as a question that, that we're seeking to answer. And it may be broad or specific or a combination of both. And an example of, of an objective of this statement is something like, the objective of this assessment is to establish whether an entity is taking reasonable steps to secure personal information in accordance with Australian Privacy Principle 11. We draw our assessment criteria from a range of publicly available resources, uh, things like the Australian Privacy Principle Guidelines um, or the Guide to Securing Personal Information, Privacy Management Framework, um, or um, another example would be the My Health Record Rule. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit now about the methodology for the assessment. Really, this is a key part of the planning phase, um, and it's where we set out to determine, essentially, the approach that the assessment team uses to gather information against the assessment criteria in order to make the assessment of the entity's performance against the identified objectives. So what does that mean? Well, we're really talking about the methods that we might use um, to undertake the assessment. So for example, um, depending on the scope of the assessment, it might be appropriate for us to do that by way of doc document review or desktop review. For example, we might set out to review a specified policy. Uh, we may also conduct interviews. They could be in person or remote. Uh, and given the current environment with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, much of our interview work is done remotely where it's not um, possible or appropriate um, uh, to, to do face-to-face -face interviews. In certain circumstances, we might also need to do direct observational or physical inspection work. And essentially, this comes into play, for example, where we're looking at um, APP 11 um, and uh, steps that an entity might take to secure personal information. So in this case, we might need to cite physical security um, and, and see exactly how uh, an entity deals with those matters uh, in practice. We might also adopt processes like doing a test checking exercise, looking at records or procedures. Um, some of our uh, current assessment work is looking at um, the compliance of telecommunications organisations in relation to 
their obligations to retain records under the Telecommunications Act. And, and that's an example of an assessment where we inspect specified records. Um, in that case, those records are very sensitive documents. So those inspections have to be done on site uh, at the premises of the telcos. And finally, another option is to conduct a poll or to undertake survey research. Next slide, please. So the assessment really kicks off um, the commencement. The official commencement is the notification, uh, which as the name suggests is the formal process of notifying the entity of the assessment. In some cases, and, and usually with more complex assessments, um, our staff will engage um, with an entity to conduct a sort of informal conference before we actually notify, before we commence the assessment. But as I said, this is usually the case with more complex assessments that have a few logistical components to work through, such as com like complex site visits and those sorts of things. So the notification is usually sent by letter uh, attached to an email. Uh, it's a formal document that sets out the intention of the commissioner to exercise her discretion to undertake an assessment of the entity. It'll set, clearly set out the powers uh, uh, under which this discretion is exercised, which is usually section 33C of the Privacy Act. It'll set out in writing clearly the scope and objectives and key criteria of the assessment. It'll uh, possibly go into some logistical matters such as proposed locations, commencement dates and duration. Uh, it'll provide contact details for the lead assessor and also seek in contact information for the, from the entity where appropriate. Uh, we also set out a brief description of the assessment process um, so it's clear the steps that are involved. And this notification usually also contains a request for information or documents from the entity from the entity to provide to us. And we usually give an entity a couple of weeks to respond to that request for documents and information. So after the um, notification letter is issued, we engage with the entity to plan the assessment. So in the case where we need to organise interviews, uh, we get in contact. Um, and identify the correct individuals and locations and those sorts of things. In this planning phase, we're also reviewing documents and the information that we've requested, and we generally plan the conduct of the assessment. We also look to publicly available information or um, conduct other relevant research. Uh, next slide, please. So on to field work. Uh, so, I mean, the most um, involved would be site attendance, and really it's the methodology of the assessment that will determine the nature of the field work. But really this is the information gathering phase of the assessment. So where we're undertaking a survey, field work is the process of seeking and receiving answers from entities. For example, that might be in an online questionnaire, uh, or field work may involve conducting interviews or site visits. So if we are on site and we're conducting interviews, um, we, we have a, a fairly uh, formalised structure. Um, so the, the field work really commences with an, a brief opening conference and that's to set out the, you know, in a broad terms, the, the plan for the assessment, um, remind people of the objective, the scope uh, and all those matters. Uh, and then we set about the process of gathering information that we need to assess the entity against each of the assessment criteria. Uh, the, the information we usually collect includes things like documents, so we might be citing um, entities process documents. Uh, we're also conducting interviews and observing um, particular processes in action if necessary. And then once we've gathered that information, we hold a brief closing conference with the key staff members. Um, so usually key executive and senior staff and other relevant staff. And in that closing conference, we talk about our preliminary findings. We, we set out the preliminary risks and findings and issues that are likely to be raised in the assessment report. And we provide that preliminary feedback um, at the closing conference, noting that it may be subject to change as we develop the, the report. Um, but really it's an opportunity for us to provide an early indication to the entity of any issues that may be identified in that draft report so that potentially the entity can take some steps to mitigate those risks. 
Um, so really, in that fieldwork stage, it's important to note that we do seek to um, notify entities of any areas of particular concern, and we try to provide open and continuous feedback to the entity, um, and we give them really give entities an opportunity to correct, amend and provide further to, further explanatory information around the issues or concerns um, that we've identified. And it's our job to consider whether, we, whether we've collected and recorded a sufficient amount of reasonable and valid information for us to make an adequate assessment finding against each of the criteria. Next slide, please. So, this stage is where we draft the assessment report. Essentially, the report content sets out the observations, analysis, findings, and recommendations or suggestions. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. We produce a draft report and clear that internally with our executive before we uh, engage in consultation with the entity in relation to the draft report. And at that stage, the entity is provided with the opportunity to give us feedback, particularly in relation to areas where uh, there may be factual inaccuracies in the report and also entities are encouraged to identify any sensitive information um, that, that may, um, may not be suitable for publication. We seek to publish our assessment reports wherever possible and if you look on our assessments webpage and there'll be a link provided uh, there on the slide, um, you can see assessments dating back for quite a few years. Um, <clears throat> So we usually publish them on our website and I do encourage you to take a look at past assessments, uh, particularly in this uh, digital health space. Um, some of those will be particularly relevant to your, to your current practices. Next slide, please. So next I'll talk about some of the outcomes of the assessment and what happens after the assessment. So one of the key outcomes of the assessment is we make suggestions and recommendations um, and we're really making recommendations to entities to address a high or medium privacy risk and suggestions in relation to low privacy risks. So what does all that mean? Well, generally speaking, a medium or high privacy risk is where an entity is likely, likely or possibly not compliant with a legislative obligation. For example, a particular Australian privacy principle or a particular rule or where the entity meets some but not all of the requirements of a particular obligation in those rules or legislation. And we make recommendations to address those risks or non-compliance. So in the case of a high privacy risk, these are steps, our recommendations, that is, are steps that the entity must really must take to address our expectations around the requirements of privacy and related legislation. Whereas for a medium privacy risk, um, these are steps that an entity should take to address our expectations in relation um, to those areas. And where risks are limited and they're within an acceptable risk tolerance, uh, you know, for example, where it's unlikely that there's a breach of any relevant legislative obligation, then we make a suggestion or of steps the entity could take, which we, which we really consider to be best, pra best practice suggestions. So these are entities that, sorry, these are steps that an entity could take, uh, but we strongly encourage them um, to take those steps, even though it's not, uh, not, not, not an obligation. And if you'd like more information about that process, that's set out in our guide to regulatory action, uh, and I think there's a link to that in, in the last slide of the presentation. So another important step after an assessment's been conducted is the follow-up process. Uh, so generally we would follow up an assessment after 12 months just to follow up with the entity to see the steps that they've taken to implement or in response to our recommendations and usually that would involve us contacting the entity via uh, by email, making contact and essentially issuing a letter where we ask, um, where we seek a response just in relation to the steps that the entity's taken. Um, to address those recommendations and usually the response from the entities in the form of a letter or perhaps in an email um, and depending on the quality and, and what's provided, um, often that's dealt with just sim simply by way of an exchange of, of emails, um, perhaps a phone call. Um, on some occasions we will conduct a follow-up assessment where either the risks um, appear to still be um, uh, active in relation to the particular issues um, and you can see on our website some of our assessments clearly set out that they're a follow-up of a previous assessment. 
Uh, in some cases, um, there may be other regulatory action that leads uh, on from, from an assessment, for example, investigations. Um, and, you know, while the primary purpose of, a, of conducting our assessments is to assist entities with their privacy practices, uh, there are some circumstances that may arise where we consider it's appropriate to consider taking further regulatory action, um, such as an investigation. So an example is where we might be conducting a risk-based assessment and we identify significant issues of concern and the entity doesn't appear willing or capable of taking steps to address those concerns. And in those circumstances, it may be appropriate for us to consider undertaking another regulatory action, um, for example, opening a commissioner-initiated investigation. So a few years ago in 2017-18, we conducted some assessments of four pharmacies and eight diagnostic imaging services in relation to their access security governance for the My Health Record System. And in those assessments, uh, we looked at um, Rule 42 or access security policies for the My Health Record System. And in relation to those assessments, um, the commissioner exercised her discretion to take further regulatory action and open some, a commissioner-initiated investigation under Section 40 of the Privacy Act. Um, the purpose of the investigations was to really inquire about the circumstances in which these assessment targets were accessing the My Health Record System without having an access security policy in place. And in particular, we sought assurance that despite the absence of those policies, there had been no instances of unauthorised access to the system. And apologies if you can hear the blower outside, but my council has decided to preen my street today. <laughs> uh, so the outcome of those investigations, well, they were finalised on the basis that two of the assessment targets implemented an access security policy that met the requirements of Rule 42 of the My Health Records Rule, and two assessment targets elected to deregister from the My Health Records system, and further information and submissions uh, was provided including uh, that there'd been no instances of unauthorised access to the system. Next slide, please. So we're currently undertaking the My Health Record Access Security Policy Assessment Program. Uh, and that's essentially comprised of two assessments. The first assessment is an initial survey of a large sample of GP clinics across Australia to assess compliance with the requirements to have a, a written access security policy under Rule 42. And the second assessment uh, is a subsequent qualitative assessment of a smaller sample of those clinics across Australia. And we're really looking at the substantive requirements of Rule 42 um, of the My Health Record Rule and Australian Privacy Principles 1.2 and 11. We're assessing GB Clinic's compliance with Rule 42 of the My Health Record Rule because we consider that access security policies are a reasonable step for healthcare provider organisations to take uh, when they're complying with Australian Privacy Principles 1.2, which is open and transparent management of personal information, and APP 11, which is security of personal information. And that's when they're handling personal information in the My Health Record system. So um, I think. That's probably where I'll, I'll wrap up my presentation. If, if, if you go to the next slide, um, there's, there's some resources on that slide, so the slide pack will be um, distributed to, um, to the group. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll end it there, and, and thanks very much. Thank you so much, Andre. That was fantastic. And um, so continue to enter your questions. We do have quite a few questions at this stage, um, but please, if you've got a question, um, just enter that into that chat area. Um, so Ben, I'll hand over to you to go through the questions now. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, first question we've got is, is it possible for draft My Health Record uh, privacy policies, I think they're probably referring here to the um, um, My Health Record Security and Access Policy, to be, to be developed to download when an organisation is signing up to My Health Record as a, as a prompt to ensure greater adoption? So, um, look, I might hand this over to, um, yeah, Kim, I think might be best to answer this, and we'll see if the IAIC would like to make a comment on that too. Thanks, Kim. So at the time, um, if we were to make the policy template available at the time an organisation is registering, that's probably too late in the process. So as part of the lead up to 
deciding to participate in the My Health Record system, the organisation is going to be needing to be developing that policy at that time. The process of registering is sort of the last step in becoming a participant. That'll be too late to have your policy in place. So you'll need to have done that beforehand. But we are going through some analysis at the moment to try and um, make some changes to the registration process so it, it emphasises that policy requirement a bit more strongly uh, to draw attention, to org for organisations' attention to be drawn to the need for that policy and to have it in place before the registration is complete. Thanks, Kim. And Diana or Andre, would you also like to make a comment on that? I was just going to say, I think that one of the important things is that, which leads into very much into Kim's answer is that um, the, the policies are, I guess it's a living document. So if, if, we're, if we're sort of putting the document in place at the very last stage of, um, of, of registration, then it's unlikely that it's, it's going to be sort of embedded in the practice the way it really needs to be. Excellent. Thanks, Andre. Yeah, and I just um, second everything that Kim and, and Andre said. Um, it's something that, that organisations should be thinking about well before they register and um, there, there are, you know, if, if you're struggling to um, develop something, there are some templates currently available out there. Um, some of the peak bodies have developed some, um, like RACGP as well as um, the Australian Digital Health Agency. But it is something that you need to think about and develop well in advance of registration. And when you are going through that registration process, there will be a point where you need to attest that you have that in place. And, um, um, and that's just a really important step as part of your registration to make sure that that's all done well, well in advance of, of getting access to that health information. Excellent. Thank you, Diana. Thanks. Uh, next question. For My Health Record policy templates, um, the agency's got a template, the RACGP has a template, and I think we've sort of, we're covering this a little bit before. So this leads to confusion uh, for practices. Can the government provide only one answer um, for the practices? So again, I'm happy to hand this over to um, you know Kim or, or again Diana or Andre to comment on. Thanks, Ben. Happy to to answer that. As I said, there are um, quite a few templates out there available. Um, I know, for example, that the RACGP has one, um, but also you know there are other sector specific ones. Um, for example, one for dentists. Um, and then there is a sort of a more generic one that's available to the Australian Digital Health Agency. Um, understand that it can be confusing for healthcare providers when they're trying to develop and which one's going to be the best one for them. Um, there's, there's no set answer on that. Um, I think your organisation can take from any of those templates what's applicable to their particular circumstances. Um, but it has been identified um, by the OAIC as, as an issue for healthcare providers and um, we have been working this year with um, quite closely with the Australian Digital Health Agency um, to develop something that could be used as a generic policy across all different areas um, in the health sector. Um, as it is still in development at the moment and um, since Andre's team is looking at this as part of um, his big assessment at the moment, their team's assessment, um, which is an ongoing assessment, we will be using the findings of that assessment to feed into the development of the template. Um, additionally, the Australian Digital Health Agency has some internal compliance activities looking at um, the, the policies of other sectors, I know, for example, allied health and pharmacies. So that information is also going to feed into um, the development of this sort of more generic template. Um, and we, we don't want to rush it, so we want to get it right. Um, and it's probably looking likely that it will be 2022 that that, will, that resource will be available, um, probably closer to the middle of the year when, when all the assessment and compliance activities are completed and those findings can provide some useful input to the development of that template. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks Diana. I we'll definitely look forward to, to seeing that. 
Um, and look, this next question relates to exactly what you're just speaking about there. Is there a My Health Record policy template that practices can use rather than develop a new policy? And absolutely. Um, in fact, Nikki, we might actually um, make sure that some of the template um, links are included in the follow-up email we'll send out to everyone um, so that it's easy for everyone to find. How many GP practices are likely to go through the assessment two process uh, over um, the 2022 period? So Andre, I'll hand over to you for that question. Uh, so, so the question was how many are likely to go in, through the process? Uh, the assessment uh, two part of the process, yep. Uh, so assessment two is 20 uh, GP clinics. They've already been notified and identified and, and we're, we're partway through that process of the assessment with them. Um, so it was 20 uh, GP clinics were identified for, for assessment two. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the policies and procedures are also part of the practice incentive programs, e-health sub-program participation. However, it is an area I'm aware of the practices are not compliant with this. Um, it's to do with the resource constraints for many small businesses. I think that's more of a comment uh, than a question, but if anyone would like to make a comment on that at all. I mean, we could, we could only really comment on the, on the, range, the way that we approach the issue, which is, we, it, it really goes down to that um, test that we look at, which is reasonable steps and it's contextual consideration. So when we uh, assess, a, say, a GP clinic, we do take into consideration um, things like the number of doctors, so a sole GP clinic, um, while their obligation to have the policy remains, it may be that the policy can be designed to be more tailored for that circumstance, whereas an entity that has lots of staff, so has lots of administrative staff as well as uh, healthcare professionals, uh, then it might be that the policy um, needs to address uh, that context. And, and a good example is you know, things like training, um, you know, which is a, one of the elements that's considered in the, in the policy, in the, in the requirement. Um, so it would be a different landscape for uh, an individual uh, GP as opposed to a, a, a practice where there are quite a few staff. So we do try and try, take on board those considerations and we certainly don't approach uh, every entity as though they're all sort of one size fits all. But the obligation does um, exist for everyone accessing the system. Excellent, thanks Andre. Uh, how many practices will be selected for part one um, of the assessments of the written access security policy? And on what basis um, would a practice be selected for the subsequent, subsequent qualitative assessment? Uh, so 300 practices have already been selected. They've already been notified and they've already provided their survey responses to the first assessment. And we're currently working on the draft report for that assessment, which we hope to be able to publish in the new year. And we think it'll provide some interesting um, and useful insights both to the agency and also to the sector about um, uh, compliance in relation to Rule 42 at a high level, because it's a de-identified report. Um, we're certainly not identifying any individual practices in that, re in that report. And in the second assessment, um, the process for determining um, which policies to review uh, we've looked at um, the, essentially we've done a, a review to identify um, policies to review while, while also um, making sure that we're looking across the spectrum of the population that was, that was identified for the first assessment. And again, for that assessment, the outcome is we engage with each of the individual um, GP clinics and we provide them with direct feedback in relation to their Rule 42 policy in the form of an individual report that's issued back to them, which is like a report card, if you will. It gives them recommendations and suggestions of steps they can take. We engage with them through that process to assist them as best we can to actually take those steps as well. And then the outcome of that assessment um, is a de-identified um, report which is looking at trends across this, the whole sector. So we'll be in a position um, to identify common areas across the group where there may have been deficiencies in relation to um, the Rule 42 policy 
or um, other matters that are sort of dealt with directly in that assessment. Excellent, thanks Andre. Um, this is a, a question we, we've, I, I think you had asked quite a lot. So what if our organisation didn't have a policy in place before we registered? What would you recommend for those organisations? Get a policy in place. <laughs> it's never too late, I guess, is the is the answer, I guess, is it fair to say? Well, I think if they were to look back on the last assessment we did, they would be able to identify by reading that assessment report um, that we launched an investigation which resulted in certain outcomes and some of those outcomes were that entities put a, a policy in place. I certainly can't say whether or not um, uh, those entities are, you know, arguably in breach of their obligations right now. So we, we would strongly recommend that they take steps immediately to address that. Um, it's a requirement of having access to the system to have the policy in place. The yep, alternative would be to deregister from the system. Exactly, and make, you know, obviously if you're not registered for My Health Record, you need to have that in place, obviously, before you register is, is obviously um, where you should be with that. Uh, will the My Health Record assessments be ongoing after 2022? Uh, so we will be conducting future assessments uh, in relation to digital health and the My Health Record. Um, the, the exact scope and and uh, what those assessments will address is is to be determined. We do have some particular areas of focus that we'll be looking at that we've already identified, uh, and we hope um, to be in a position in, in the new year where we can provide some some notice to the sector about. Um, the sorts of things that we'd be looking at. Um, but essentially, we, we do conduct these ongoing. We're funded to conduct them ongoing. So we would be conducting assessments um, in this sector for the, for the foreseeable future. Uh, it's a key part of our, our, our practice in terms of assessments. It's a key part of our portfolio of work. Great, thank you. Look, this is an interesting one and probably applies to, um, I guess, some hospitals that may just be uh, uploading rather than viewing my health record. So my uh, organisation only uploads information and doesn't have access to my health record. Do I still need a policy? Yes. That, that, thanks, Short Jim. answer, yes. <laughs> it, is still, it is still accessing the system. Even if it is only a one-way information flow, it is still accessing the system. So yes. It just means that your policy will, will reflect that nature. Yeah, that's right. And I, I, there's a follow-up to this one as well, which is the requirement says that our policy doesn't have to address certain matters if they're not applicable. How do I determine um, or record this? Uh, I would suggest simply explaining in the policy if, if your organisation has determined whether it's because of size or there is an element that your, your organisation doesn't need because you don't interact with the system in a certain way, I would suggest explaining that in the policy, just that reasoning. Um, Andre, you might have seen some policies of this nature. You might be able to expand on that. Thanks, Kim. Um, we'd make the same recommendation or, or that the, the, the policy does explicitly state whether and a practice believes that the particular requirement doesn't apply. I think there's a couple of benefits. It makes it very clear for staff in relation to um, the particular practices of the policy, uh, sorry, of the clinic. <laughs> um, so it's very clear if it's written in a document for staff uh, exactly what the practice does or doesn't do. Um, and, and you know, this, this document is supposed to be, a, I guess, a living document which reflects exactly um, what's going on on the ground um, for the entity. Excellent, thank you. Um, why do I need a Rule 42 policy if I have a privacy policy or information security policy, um, I guess, in your organisation already? Uh, I, I can take that well, question. Well, put simply, because it's an obligation of the system. Sorry, go on. Well, we think there's, we see a bit of confusion around this particular issue, but I think they're, they're very different documents. So, as Kim said, the uh, access security policy is a requirement under Rule 42, uh, whereas a, a privacy policy um, or, a, or another form of security policy 
uh, is not a specific document that's re that's responding um, to the requirements of Rule 42. Excellent. Um, and again, relates to the policies. Does an organisation need to have a standalone My Health Record policy, or can they sort of just incorporate into that into one of their existing policies? Do you want me to take this one, Andre? Um, I guess if you have a look at our guidance on on the OAIC's website, and I think we we could post um, a link to that in the chat. Um, our, our advice is that it's best practice for the Rule 42 policy to be containing a single document and it's separate from a, a privacy policy generally. Um, and it just, for everyone involved, employees and, and others that interact with your organisation, it provides them with a really clear, unambiguous and easy way to access information about the way that they're going to meet their access um, obligations under the My Health Record Act. Great. Uh, what happens if there's an adverse finding in an assessment? And I think this is something that sort of worries a lot of uh, healthcare organisations out there. I think a lot of people think that, you know, there's, you know, <laughs> might be worried they're going to jail or something under horrendous. Um, if, what, what I guess is the process there if there's an adverse uh, finding? Uh, so an entity would receive, I mean, when we say an adverse finding, I, I guess what we're talking about is that we make a recommendation that, that an entity address like a privacy risk or an area of non-compliance. So I mean, assessments are supposed to be an educative um, piece of independent assurance that we can provide to an entity. So um, the outcome of an assessment uh, would, would hopefully be that the entity takes our recommendation on board and takes steps to fix the issue. And then if they're unsure, then they would we would talk to them about it and we, we would um, probably be able to work out if an entity didn't understand as well because we're engaging with the staff directly. Um, so, so our intention is always to try and assist as much as possible to get the entity to, into a position where it's compliant. Um, when we're talking about I guess the 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 more adverse outcomes that can happen uh, that would require um, certain things to be in place. We'd have to identify certain risk factors, and we set this out in our regulatory action guide. Um, so you can find out more information about when we when we do launch an investigation. And, and I'd, you know, I'd recommend that people, if they're interested, should read it. Uh, it's not not too long, and it's in the link in the to the presentation. Um, and it's important because even in an investigation, the OEIC engages closely with an entity through that process, um, again, to try and achieve an outcome of compliance. Um, so uh, there are definitely penalties um, for breaches of the My Health um, Records Act. There are civil penalties, um, so we can't downplay that. There, are, uh, there is a real risk if you are non-compliant. But in terms of the assessment process, what we're seeking to do is to try and help you achieve compliance. Great, thanks, Andrea. It's a yeah, a lot more friendly process than I think what some people might be expecting. Um, why does the OAIC do the assessments instead of the Australian Digital Health Agency? I think I can take that one, Ben. Thanks, um, it's basically for transparency. Um, ADHA is the the agency is the system operator and the OAIC is our regulator. So having somebody who is independent and very knowledgeable about the requirements, is it provides comfort and transparency to the sector and also to the community. So it's very important that the OAIC does this, I think. Thanks, Delaney. Look, that's all the questions that have come in today. So um, we'll, we'll wrap up the, um, the webinar now. And I'd particularly like to thank our panellists um, who've been on today. So uh, Diana and Andre from the OAIC, thank you guys very much for your time. Uh, and also Kim and Delaney from the agency, um, very valuable input and some really great questions we got asked um, as well there. Um, at the end of, when you leave the webinar today, there'll actually be an evaluation will come up. Um, so please, um, if you can complete that, that really helps us with our education. So if you could fill that in, that'd be fantastic. The other thing, I, and you can see on the screen here, 
the moment and we'll be sending all these slides out is that the agency actually runs a number of um, training sessions around My Health Record. So we do a lot within people's clinical software. We can actually show you how My Health Record works within your particular clinical software if you're using one of those ones listed on the screen there. Some other really important ones and, and one that particularly relates today um, is about the understanding compliance requirements for accessing My Health Record, and that's practical tips for practice managers. Um, certainly encourage people to go to that session. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of the information we've spoken about today is covered in those uh, in those sections there. And the other thing too is we run some Q and A sessions from time to time as well, where you can come on and just ask any questions you'd like about My Health Record. So. Um, that's those, and if you're after more information and support, we had the OAIC's details on there, and we'll include that in the follow-up email that we send out. Um, and these are the details for the Australian Digital Health Agency if you're after additional information. 